Hello and welcome. You're watching to the point. Today is Jawaharlal Nehru's 125th birth anniversary. It also falls in the 50th year of his death. So tonight we devote the entire show to an assessment of India's first prime minister's legacy during the 17 years he spent in office. Nehru wasn't just the country's longest serving prime minister, for many he was the best. Certainly the impact he had was perhaps greater than any of his successors. Today, however, Nehru is as much criticized as he is admired. He may even have become a polarizing figure. Which is why we need to look at his legacy to understand what he stood for, what he achieved, how much we owe him, as well as how much we can hold him responsible for. Those are the issues I hope to cover over the next one hour. Joining me now to discuss Jawaharlal Nehru's legacy as Prime Minister is the former Governor of West Bengal and author of Nehru and Sri Lanka, Gopal Krishn Gandhi, the former Vice-Chancellor of Jamia Millia Islamia and author of the Nehru's, Mushirul Hassan, the Gardener Professor of History at Harvard University and Trinamool MP, Shogato Bos, former editor and biographer of Indira Gandhi, Inder Malhotra, and the well-known BJP-supporting columnist and commentator, Swapan Das Gupta. Let's start with a few general questions about Nehru before we come to specific issues and subjects connected with his 17 years as Prime Minister. Mr. Gandhi, in his time, Nehru was a much admired Prime Minister. Today, you could almost say he's become a much misunderstood one. Is that because we've forgotten his great achievements or because we no longer remember how daunting were the challenges he had to tackle? Largely because we are now in a, in a, in a phase of critical re-examination of time, in a phase of uh, reconsideration of history, and we have moved forward from adulation to analysis. Nehru would have been the first person to welcome a critical re-evaluation of his times, of his life, of his contribution. And I think we should be unsparing in our assessment of the man and of his contributions to India okay. for the reason that he would have liked us to be so. And for the additional and perhaps more important reason that critical analysis is essential to an understanding of our situation today. Absolutely. I, I, Flattery I, and adulation are the last methods of Absolutely. understanding but you any haven't, person but you haven't answered my question any contribution. you've told us how we should proceed with this discussion and your advice is very welcome but i want you briefly to answer my question why is he misunderstood is it because we've forgotten his achievements or because we no longer remember how daunting were the challenges he had to face i do not think he is being misunderstood today. i think he is being understood in a wider sense he is also being understood as a product of his times and also a creator of his times. Okay. And I think the move from uh, understanding uh, in, a, in a sense of just admiration and uh, almost bordering on worship to an understanding bordering on understanding in, in, from, from internal resources of history is a very welcome thing. I do not believe he is being misunderstood. Okay. He is certainly being misquoted and misrepresented. But he is not being misunderstood. I think there is a greater awareness of him okay. as there is of his, of, of his colleagues like Gandhi. Let's build on that very interesting point, not being misunderstood, but being understood as a product of his time. Now, as you know, Nehru was a Fabian socialist. He was an English liberal. He was a third world anti-colonialist. And he was also a very refined gentleman. Are those qualities or descriptions which today we no longer fully understand? Because many people don't seem to be in sync with them anymore. I, I do, before I answer that, I do want to, uh, to respond to the point that Mr. Gandhi has just made. I, broadly speaking, agree with it. But I think uh, the re-evaluation or the critical assessment is very welcome. But why should this re-evaluation coincide with the change in regime? Uh, okay. I mean, but if, let, let's, if, leave, let's, leave, let's leave politics out of it. No, I don't not, want this to not, become it's polemical. Not, it's, not, it's not politics, it's, it's a reality. I mean, if you look at the right statements, if you look at the writings in the but, media... But Professor Mushir Hassan, this is not about what the BJP is doing to Nehru. This is about Nehru himself. So, no, no, come I'm back not, to my question. Yeah, okay. okay. But I, I do Are those great qualities things that we no longer fully understand? 
because today the world seems to be out of sync with them. Well, I, th I think in, in certain sections of our population, in our educated elites, they are certainly uh, understood and they are talked about and they are discussed. People do write dissertations, people uh, But do we do no longer admire a man because he's a liberal or because he's a refined gentleman? Do we do no longer consider those essential human qualities? Well, because I, th I think liberalism is, is or well, secularism is no longer the kind of value that uh, that many sections of our society attach themselves to uh, and that is why they do not find uh, these qualities in Nehru's So these are qualities of an age that's passed and we are no longer in sync with that age? To some extent I would say that, yes. Shankar Bose, let's come now to some specific issues and subjects arising out of Nehru's 17 year long prime ministership. From day one Nehru had to handle the consequences of partition and the deep wounds it left behind. Today many people forget how daunting a challenge that must have been in 1947. How well do you think Nehru acquitted himself? Uh, well, uh, I think given the challenges that he faced in 1947, uh, he was a tremendously successful uh, prime minister in the early decades of India's independence. Uh, but, uh, Karan, you are uh, focusing on 17 years of his prime ministership. On his 125th birth anniversary, I would also like to add uh, that uh, he was uh, a giant of our freedom struggle. And if Mahatma Gandhi had um, turned the Congress into a mass movement in 1920, it was Jawaharlal Nehru, along with Shubhash Chandra Bose, who enthused our students and youth in the 1920s Absolutely. and 1930s. But, but Professor and, Bose, I'm concentrating yes. deliberately on the 17 years of his prime ministership, so let's stick to that. Otherwise, we'll become so widespread we won't have focus. So come back to my question. Uh, How so did he acquit the... himself in handling that daunting challenge of the consequences of partition and the deep wounds they left behind? You know, there had been a terrible division along lines of religious community in 1947. And to some extent, uh, Nehru has to be held responsible for not helping Gandhi to avert the tragic partition. Uh, because he uh, could have only averted partition within a federal framework and a sharing of power, uh, which he was not prepared to do okay. in 1947. He inherited the strong center of the British Raj. Now, uh, on balance, I would say his positive uh, achievements in the post-47 period outweigh the negatives. But I would still say that I wish that he had conceded a linguistic reorganization of provinces before Otis Sri Lamarlu died okay. uh, of a hunger strike in 1952. I wish that he had not thrown his good friend Sheikh Abdullah into prison well, in well, 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 just a moment, Professor, Professor Bose, Professor Bose yes. let's, let's, let's focus on each issue separately, otherwise the audience okay. who doesn't know Nehru as intimately do do get confused. Are you saying to me on that critical key question of handling the consequences of partition that he acquitted himself well? Stick to that for a moment. Yes, because uh, he, uh, it, he was very inclusive, he made sure that all com communities had equal rights as citizens. He was the architect of our parliamentary democracy. Okay. On that specific question, in terms of the aftermath of partition, by and large, he acquitted himself well. He had to take help from Gandhi in, in the immediate aftermath. For example, in um, making sure that the Muslims in Delhi were protected. Gandhi's fast in January 1948 was crucial. Uh, and Gandhi also made sure that Nehru's government uh, okay. decided on a fair share of assets with Pakistan, uh, partition having taken place and Pakistan having okay. been conceded. So I think Nehru had to be prodded, uh, but I think he acquitted himself well in healing the wounds of partition. But I would give a, a lot of credit to Mahatma Gandhi in the okay. last months of his life. Swapan Das Gupta, to Nehru. Swapan das Gupta, many of us grew up looking upon Nehru as the father of Indian democracy. How much credit do you give him for the fact that India blossomed and firmly established itself as a democracy? Well, if you take the very limited point about democracy, the, uh, the institutionalization of a parliamentary form of government the fact that elections of a multi-party competitive nature 
were held and continue to be held, I think Nehru's contribution is quite, phenomen is quite phenomenal. He's a person who enjoyed sparring on the floor of parliament. He enjoyed competitive politics conducted within a certain framework. And I think much more than some of the Gandhians who would rather have gone in for a more panchayati level democracy, the fact that the form of parliamentary democracy which we see today has been entrenched and been allowed to be institutionalized, I think owes a phenomenal degree of credit to Jawaharlal Nehru. I think that's one point. I think there is absolutely no disagreement, even if there are other facets of his legacy which are more contested. Okay. On the question of democracy, I think there is a complete unanimity. And I will come to those other aspects of his legacy in a moment's time. But first, Indra Marotra, other third world countries that gained independence in the 40s, 50s and 60s, I'm talking of our neighbor Pakistan, but also Indonesia and Philippines in the neighborhood, as well as Ghana and Kenya and Africa, all of them veered towards some form of autocratic or dictatorial rule. That didn't really happen in India. If you look narrowly at Nehru's period, briefly it did happen with the emergency, but then it reversed itself. How much of the credit for that fact do you give to Nehru? I give it totally as a matter of fact. Uh, what I agree with what, what uh, Mr. Das Gupta has said, but I will go further. Because he very very assiduously built up every institution that undermines uh, 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 not undermines and that underpins uh, underpins underpins any democratic system to that he added uh, he was also he was the founder of of laying the foundations of science and technology in this country yeah okay. and uh, as for democracy he he respected the opposition people and hold, the opposition respected him no, uh, and parliament was a great instrument it's a very and fair point what you're making. What happened to Parliament? Now you can see after him. You're absolutely right. He was passed one of the greatest parliamentarians, a great stickler for attendance. Kupal Gandhi, many people today associate Nehru with the non-aligned policy that he followed. Do you believe non-alignment gave India the capacity as a country that was poor and powerless at the time to box significantly above its weight? Or did it ultimately deny India the benefits that would have accrued had India allied with either the Soviet Union or America? Which do you see of the two? I think the non-aligned movement and the non-aligned uh, uh, concept was uh, a direct outcome of the foreign policy stances of the Indian National Congress, which immediately on the EU, the transfer of power, and in fact when Prime Minister Nehru was heading the interim government, acquired shape in the Asian Relations Conference when a large number of people from uh, Asia, True. some of them future yeah. Prime Ministers that and accept, of countries sir. were present. And that's the antecedents of non-alignment. There are I, I now accept no that. leaders amongst us and uh, no followers. You know, I accept what you're that saying because that's the, the antecedents. What became non-alignment. But the point I'm asking you is did non-alignment as a policy give India the capacity to box above its weight? despite the fact that at the time it was a poor and powerless country it certainly did because it gave india the um, space to speak impartially to speak from a position of non-affiliation affinities yes but not affiliations and that was a very decisive factor in what became uh, uh, international support to movements like the uh, like the liberation struggle in South Africa, okay. for which India was one of the first and leading uh, exponents. Now, Muchinul Hassan, Nehru got a lot of criticism in 1956 when he failed to criticize the Soviet Union for its invasion of Hungary, although in the same year he was very outspoken in criticism of Britain and France over the Suez. In fact, for Nehru, imperialism was always only Western imperialism. He didn't accept that there was such a thing as Soviet imperialism. Would you believe that this is one area where perhaps prejudice or personal preference got the better of his judgment? Yes, I agree. The criticism is quite fair because 
there was a degree of inconsistency in his stand in Hungary. Uh, and that's largely because I, I think he didn't have adequate information uh, about the nature of the Soviet invasion. But let's accept that he had a preference for the Soviet Union from the time he went to, uh, to that country in 1927, I think, for the first time. And he was fascinated by what the Soviet Union uh, had achieved uh, and, as a matter of fact, tried to model the Indian economy, as we all know, uh, planning and so on and so forth were all inspired by the Soviet Could example. Could there be another explanation for his failure to criticize the Soviet invasion of Hungary? The fact that he realized India's political dependence on the Soviet Union was so large, he didn't want to risk it in case the Soviets didn't accept and tolerate his fair criticism. That's a fair point, but it's not just political dependence, it's also economic dependence because, uh, because we must remember... Which doubles the fact problem. Because all the, the, the steel plants in the beginning were actually the United States refused to support True. them and it's the Soviet Union. So this Union. made it very difficult for him to be critical of the Soviet Union openly because he didn't want to endanger India's development policies. I would accept that, yes. yes. Shankar Bose, it's said that Nehru never understood or perhaps never liked what he saw as American tastes and values and certainly Nehru's meetings with Kennedy, as Kennedy himself said, were not a great success. Do you think that was one of the problems of Nehru's upbringing and his attitude and his sensitivities that he felt a certain, if this is the correct word, allergy for American tastes and values and that he never quite overcame it? You pointed out he was a refined gentleman uh, uh, but very much bred in the British uh, tradition. Uh, I have to say that uh, he did have quite a successful visit to the United States in the late 1940s. He was fated by the media here. Uh, and uh, so I, I wouldn't um, uh, exaggerate uh, an allergy that he might have had for American values. But what he probably saw was that America was stepping into Britain's shoes as sort of the new uh, imperialist power. And uh, I would say that um, he actually had a blind spot about the Soviet Union. It was not just a lack of information. It was an ideological blind spot. Because even when he praised the Soviet Union way back in the 1930s, you know, Stalinist terror was going on there. And yet he didn't quite see it. But on balance, I think what we need to focus on is his decision to keep India non-aligned. And that enabled India to become the leader of uh, many newly independent countries uh, of the developing world. You know, India was quite early in the process of decolonization. We won independence in 1947. We sometimes forget that most countries of Asia and Africa won independence during the decades of the 1950s and 60s sure. and early 1970s. And I think Nehru positioned India to become the voice of a newly emerging decolonized world okay. in Asia and Africa. Uh, that's what we should, I think, remember about his, uh, uh, his non-alignment. We okay. typically focus on Bandung 1955. Absolutely. That may not have been wholly successful because I think Chu and Lai overshadowed him in Bandung. True, as true. Many historians you you make us. a very fair point about non-alignment that it gave India, as I used that phrase earlier, the capacity to box significantly above its weight. Right. Non-alignment, Swapandas Gupta, is clearly thought by many to be one of Nehru's most successful policies. In contrast, perhaps his biggest failure was his China policy, which culminated in the 1962 war, which not only did India lose, but left the country with a serious complex that's continued for 50 years, if not more. Now, Nehru was convinced in his lifetime that China would never attack India. Would you say that was another blind spot in his thinking? Well, undeniably so. I think he had a certain uh, view of so-called communist regimes, which were rather a bit too rose-tinted. Uh, the, the, the case of Hungary, which you cited, was certainly not a case of lack of information. All his leftist friends in the United Kingdom at that time were completely outraged by what would happen when, when the Soviet tanks rolled into Budapest. I think likewise, he thought of China as something that a socialist country cannot wage aggressive war 
that was an article of faith and that was also something which even if you look at some of the documents of the communist party at that time they too believed in it and i think the issue of non-alignment is linked to this you've given a very great certificate to non-alignment now let me say that while non-alignment did certainly position india as one of the pioneers of the anti-colonial movement i think there was also an uh, there was also a collateral damage which happened, which is that earlier Indian foreign policy, which in a shorthand way we could call a Curzonian view, had India's influence stretching from Aden to Singapore, which is that it was neighborhood centric. And therefore, India drew its clout in the world on the account of its ability to, man okay. to be the predominant power in the neighborhood. I think by diffusing that issue, and concentrating on other fact, uh, uh, you know, a, a sort of a nebulous third worldism, Nehru lost that focus with okay. the result that Indian influence, whether in Sri Lanka, whether in uh, whether in Pakistan or in China, the Tibet issue comes across as one of that. So, if you put it within that framework, I think the China disaster of 1962 stemmed from both a misunderstanding and a lack of understanding of China as well as an unwitting casualty of his non-aligned movement. Okay, in the Barotra for many people and not just Neville Maxwell, Nehru's forward policy was unthinkingly provocative at a time when the Indian Army simply didn't have the capacity or the equipment to handle the consequences of that provocation. Do you believe this is a fair criticism okay. of Nehru's handling of the border dispute with China or do you think this criticism can only be made in hindsight? Uh, look, uh, may, if I have your permission, let me add, let me add a word about Hungary well, come, as well. Come, well, come back, no, sir. Come uh, back, come, uh, come back. Uh, let's let's no, stick no, to no, this. Would you please? No, no, because this is vital. It is not, it was not ideology, it was not economic development. We, we, were, we were dependent on the Russian, on the Soviet uh, 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 veto on the issue of Kashmir on which all the West was united against us. Okay. And, and nobody, you know, the matter of security, if he wants his country's security, he would do it. But uh, uh, now about, uh, about the forward policy, now, firstly, that Neville Maxwell is not the best of the witnesses. He is, he is pro, he, 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 he is uh, anti-Indian, and the Chinese refer to him always as a friendly journalist. Yeah, there was something wrong with this policy, but policy because it gave the Chinese uh, an, enough uh, excuse to attack. However, however, the. The, the handling of China, which as, as everybody I hold to be his biggest mistake, big mistake, that was very strange on two counts to me. He was, uh, it is quite wrong that it was, it was Krishna Menon who said the socialist countries will not help. And if you read, if you read what he told uh, G. Partha Sarthi before sending him to ambassador um, at Beijing, he said, don't trust them. Okay. And send me a report directly to me and give no copy to anybody. Even in 1954, when uh, his oh. sister, uh, Vijay Lakshmi oh, no. Pandit, come, come, was come, come, come back to the China. forward policy. We can't afford to be so discussive. No, come no, back to the forward a, policy. That's not telling you the forward policy. But the trouble with the forward policy was a source of trouble. Trouble, and it was a source of trouble because of Nehru's, Nehru's, Nehru's belief that the Chinese will. You know, there will be, there will be at the most a battalion level crash, okay. there will be skirmishes here and there, but the Chinese will do nothing big. Absolutely. Can I, can I pick up on that, that point, Gopal Krishna Gandhi and put no, it no, to you? Sir, may, may was I, there a certain... May I just was, add, may, may, can, let, let me, may let me just add one more word. Yes, go ahead. Uh, that is, if uh, uh, Maxwell has written uh, India's uh, China war. And the great Harvard uh, uh, sinologist Roderick Bethacher, in the third volume of his, uh, his, his History of Origin of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, has a whole very accurate 
and very objective thing on India China relations okay. and the war. And the title and title of that chapter is Mao's India War. Okay, the exact opposite of Neville Maxwell's. Okay. Let me pick up on that point that was made halfway through that answer, Mr. Gandhi and put it to you. Was Nehru gullible in some ways in his attitude to China, the belief that China would never attack India, the belief that you could have a forward policy that deliberately and consciously encroached upon what China considered its territory without being militarily prepared to handle the, the consequences? Right but I think uh, it stems from a larger uh, condition of mind, which is trust. Nehru believed in trusting people, institutions and neighbours. And uh, this was clear when he was a leader of the Congress party, uh, when he trusted people who were not of his own point of view within the party. And he also wanted to forge equations with others outside his party. And the same thing was uh, manifest in his affairs with associations with countries in the neighborhood when he became prime minister. And I think China was uh, a, a great example of his trust not having been fully justified. Isn't in that fact, gullibility by another name? Isn't that gullibility by another name? When you trust and your trust is not justified, it is. But, it's uh, gullibility. I think this, it's always right to see any um, any action or any person by his or that action's best meaning and then see its second and third best meaning. Oh, I think gullibility is, is, is a kind of feature of naivete, also of a kind of um, innocence which is bordering on lack of wit. That is not how his trust came from. Let his trust came from a larger uh, sense of common and shared destinies between the great Asian countries, China and India. Okay. And I think he let, was uh, he was mistaken in that. And let, 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 me bring in, let me bring quite, in Professor Hassan, who's listening to you and later. nodding his head. And I don't know whether you're nodding your head in agreement or disagreement. Was Nehru too trusting? Did that verge into gullibility? To call Nehru gullible over China, are we being rude or are we simply being truthful? I think we've forgotten the role of Krishna Menon. That is very, very critical. But Nehru was Prime Minister. He was only Defence Minister and he could have yeah, been sacked but, whenever Nehru wanted to. But, I mean, if you know the relationship between Nehru and Krishna Menon, then you would, you would know what I'm trying to suggest. Krishna Menon, Nehru dependent on Krishna Menon a great deal, followed his advice, followed his assessment of the China situation. And I think uh, the reports about the defence preparedness, etc., were all based on what Nehru was uh, fed with by Krishna Menon. But then you're saying something very interesting. You're saying that on China, Nehru allowed his judgment to be I think subordinated so. to I, Krishna Menon. I would say that. I would, uh, I would go to the extent of saying that. I think that's a pretty damning thing to say of a man who's prime minister. Well, prime ministers also make mistakes and <laughs> commit errors of judgment. And in this case, China is. was a mistake. I think there was there was a there was an error of judgment in, in on Nehru's part on Nehru's part. Sapan Das Gupta, is China going to be the black mark, the damning failure, the nemesis that Nehru's reputation can never shake off? 